Okay, students, uh, we are going to do another lecture and um, see if this works. And we are oh, I see. Um, going to now do this, where we're going to have, uh, we're going to have lecture five. This is lecture five, and it's going to be on understanding the electric permittivity and the magnetic susceptibility. Um, so what I want to do that's not done uh, very well in Marquez is to give a little bit more, uh, or at least give any, uh, physical understanding of epsilon and mu, how they come about, and <clears throat> what are some of the things you can do to try to engineer those, engineer those to be numbers that you want. Uh, so typically with glass type materials, you have a relative, a relative permittivity of um, like 2.1 or so. Uh, but why do you have that? Uh, what in what within the silicon oxide, the glass, causes it to be 2.1 as opposed to minus 2.1? All right. So we studied uh, a little bit uh, about some aspects of permittivity uh, already within the Kramer-Kronig relation and also relationships of what epsilon, various real parts and imaginary parts of epsilon have to be along with dispersion in order for epsilon to be a, a physical parameter, one that uh, adheres to causality and, uh, and other things. And, but today we're going to uh, go a little bit further and uh, understand what within the material is causing epsilon to be particular values, and say with mu, the magnetic permeability. So, um, so that's what we're going to do. So let's first start. Oh, we on the yeah, I think we're okay. Uh, let's first start with the electric permittivity, epsilon. So that we're going to be talking about that, and then we're going to be talking about um, the permeability. And just like with maybe some of the other lectures, hopefully this isn't going to be all that long of a lecture. But at the end of it, you'll understand uh, where. Uh, the state of metamaterials was at uh, prior to where Smith and Pendry came in in the late 1990s, early 2000s. And uh, with people being sort of at their, uh, uh, sort of have exhausted everything they, they could possibly do to try to get or find the naturally occurring materials that had epsilon and mu both being negative. So then we had to. Uh, look at say okay we can't do that where do we go from here so so let's look at this permittivity in a different way so when an electric field is applied across a material it can produce a flow of electric current J capital J and or produce an, a an alignment of electrically polar molecules um, so let's look at the lab all right so for the moment we're not going to look at any current J uh, and we're going to just focus on um, the polarization of molecule, molecules within the material. All right. So, and then later on, of course, uh, you'll realize we'll probably do the uh, the opposite, where we'll have a material that doesn't have polar molecules and focus on J. And uh, but for the moment, we're going to be looking at no electric current and a material with a uniform distribution of polar molecules. Um, all right, so this is what we have, a figure of this sort, where we have an external field uh, being applied across a slab, and that slab is composed of uh, molecules that are polar, uh, meaning that you'll have one side, in the presence of an electric field, you can have one side uh, be having a net negative part, uh, and one side of the molecule, okay? So this is, I, I draw this as if only one molecule sort of makes the, the width of the slab, but it's really a whole bunch of different, uh, a, a many, many hundreds of millions of trillions or so, or even more, uh, molecules across this slab, all right? And each one is, uh, its charge distribution is warped in this way, namely the molecule is polarized. So that's nothing new to you, this type of thing. So it's polarized in this way when you have an electric field. And this is how it would naturally be polarized, that when you have an electric field, you would want the positive cloud 
a positive charge would be skewed in the direction of the electric field and the negative cloud would be skewed in the opposite direction of the electric field. That's what happens because you uh, in materials or positive charges once feel a force in the direction F is equal to Q times E. So if Q is positive, a force is in the positive direction as well and the positive charges go in the same direction of the electric field. No way around it. For polar molecules, that's the way it always is. And negative and the negative charges likewise go the other way. So then this creates this creates a dipole. This right here creates a dipole, and you look at the electric field produced by that dipole and you say, fine, it's just a simple uh, two-point charge. You can look at it as two-point charges, but you have a net field going from right to left in the opposite direction of the applied external electric field, all right? So then the total field will be the sum of the two, all right? You'll have the applied external field plus the counterposing, meaning uh, the thing that fights against it, uh, the, the electric field produced by the polarization of the molecules. So um, since that fights against it, uh, you will have a net lowering of the electric field in a material, a normal, naturally occurring material, relative to what that field is in the vacuum. All right? So you go from a higher electric field here to a lower electric field here to a higher electric field on the other side in the vacuum on the right-hand side of the material. Um, and uh, so that's, so that's, uh, that's what's happening with this. So the, and so this right here is the electric field produced by the polar molecules. It is in the opposite direction of the applied external field. The total field is the sum of the two, which is uh, less than, because this goes against it, um, against the external field, it's uh, it, E subtotal is less than E external. All right? So that's what we have. Um, so P, now we're going to be working with this, cons this uh, vector P. It is the polarization or the dipole moment per unit volume. So it's called both of those things in books. Uh, and it, capital P, is a differential type of quality and quantity where you have many polar molecules each with a positive and negative charge, uh, plus Q and minus Q. And those positive and negative charge pairs are separated, uh, the positive from the negative, by a vector distance D. All right. And so uh, we take a sort of a volume element, delta V in volume, and then we sum up the number of positive negative pairs within that volume. And then capital P is the ratio of, the, of those two things the number, the sum of QD of the, of the dipoles over delta V. And the limit as delta V goes to zero. Not quite zero, because you still need a good number of dipoles within your delta V, but making it pretty small, all right? That's what capital B, P is defined as. So that's in any electromagnetic textbook. Um, Polarization produces a bound effective charge density, all right? So um, within Coulomb's law and Maxwell's equations, you have these rows. Rows are the charge densities. Polarization produces a contribution to those charge densities in two ways. One is, going, is a volume charge density. That's this right here. And then the other is a surface charge density, and that's given right here. All right? So that's easy to get, and it's in Sudoku, um, uh, certainly in any book on how they get this. And um, it's relatively simple. They look at one dipole first. Um, and then they do some vector algebra, uh, uh, Green's theorem on the on some vector quantities, uh, and then you, they, they do an integration over 
uh, many dipoles that, and then those collection of dipoles constitutes a material. And, uh, and then out of that, uh, they're able to identify this as a net effective charge density. All right. So it's just, just in Sudiku, but I'm not, don't, I'll refer you to any e &M book uh, to get those equations, but you'll see where they come in here in a moment. Um, in, in fact, immediately. So, all right, what happened? So we have Maxwell's equations where we, uh, we know those are true, so we can certainly start with that. And so we start with uh, del dot e sub t. Now this is going to be the total field in the material. The total field in the material. All right. It could be a combination of the external field plus the field produced by the polarization, but it is the total field. All right. Del dot e sub t is equal to rho sub t over epsilon naught. <clears throat> and rho sub t is the total charge. But the total charge we can write as a sum of two things. One is the free charge, charge that we either put in uh, because we uh, dope a semiconductor with uh, ions uh, that have enough charge, um, or their conduction band electrons that are free to move throughout, uh, say in a metal, those would be um, free charges. Um, so uh, there can be a number of different types of charges that are lumped in this term, but uh, really they're all the other charges except for the charges that are bound to the molecule, all right? And those are the bound charges, it's right here. So you have the bound charges, uh, those are the charge clouds around the center of a molecule that are skewed or warped as you apply an electric field. Then all other types of charges come into here, all right? Conduction band electrons, valence band holes, uh, charges uh, due to ion implantation or anything of that sort. Um, all right, so, but we have this right here. This is the volume chart. So uh, we can go back up to the definition of, of volume charge, where a lecture five, come on, there. And uh, have this. My computer's slow. I gotta re reset this. So we put that into this equation here. We have, um, and so we take over the epsilon naught over to this side here, and then we substitute this equation into here, this right there, and we get. Uh, we're able to bring over the del dot capital P to the right hand side, to the left hand side, and then we have del dot E naught uh, E sub T plus P is equal to the uh, free charge, uh, rho sub V. So we identify what, what is in the parentheses as another field-like quantity called D, the electric flux density or the electric displacement. They're both called one or the other, or both sometimes in textbooks. So rho and so del dot capital D is equal to rho v. So um, what th this replaces then the del dot e is equal to rho over epsilon naught. The difference between those two, the del dot e versus the del dot d, is what's on the right hand side. On the del dot e, there's rho total over epsilon naught. So it's both the bound charge and the uh, free charge densities. But with the del dot d, it is only the free charge. Okay? Um, so, so we have the um, we have the d is equal to epsilon naught. E T plus P vector vector vector. All right. So so D is uh, going to be affected or generated by um, the free charge that is within the material. So okay. So what is D? D is the electric flux density or the electric displacement. 
It is produced by freely moving charge or externally inserted charge. It is not the total electric field. We'll get back to that in a moment. Um, and you'll see why. D is also D also produces a displacement current. Now this is going to be important later on. D produces a displace what's called a displacement current. According to the formula J, this displacement current J sub dis dis displacement is equal to del d over d dt over dt all right um eft is just the total electric field okay now this is where it starts getting a little trickier um so often Capital P varies linearly with respect to E sub T. So uh, a lot of materials, um, most materials, you have a linear relationship between P and E sub T according to this equation here. All right. So substituting that back into here, we get that we can write um, D as wholly a function of E of T and in this way here, all right? So we have, uh, we have now epsilon naught is common to these two terms. That's uh, uh, here and here. We can take the epsilon naught out, and then we have one plus chi, the electric susceptibility, um, which is normally uh, positive. And, uh, and then uh, we, denote 1 plus chi as epsilon r, which is the relative permittivity, and the epsilon naught times epsilon r is just epsilon, which is the permittivity without the word relative, just the flat out per permittivity of the material. So D then is proportional to the total electric field, and the constant proportionality is epsilon. It's not really a constant. It uh, varies according to a lot of things. Uh, temperature, frequency, of course, um, sometimes even direction. This is an anisotropic material and so forth. But um, so D is equal to epsilon E sub T. All right. All right. Um, but we will get back to this. I think we get back to it just in a moment. So Capital P, if capital P is proportional to E, the electric field, in fact, the total electric field, E sub T, as, uh, as of right here, as the polar molecules align, meaning as they polarize, as they align in response to the total electric field, to, uh, they start, uh, they counterpose, they align against um the applied external electric field. Therefore, as you ramp this up and allow the molecules to align better and better, what they're doing is they're they are lowering uh, the electric field within the material. All right, and and they will be weakening the force or the impetus uh, for a further alignment of the charge concentrations, charge or the polarization of the molecules, okay? So you basically, as the particles align, they sort of take away uh, the force that was causing them to align in the first place. It's not that they, they oscillate back and forth between aligned and, and misaligned, it's just that there is a net steady state degree of alignment that happens, all right? Um, <clears throat> And and so if it's if it's the case where you that you very well could have uh, enough molecules within the material and th then being able to polarize enough such that uh, you can that those polarized molecules the electric field from those can totally erase um, or make zero the uh, the uh, total electric field within the material, but that's extraordinary because then um, you 
then you would basically, if it's zero, then it's uh, then it's back down to then what's causing the fields to the molecules to align in the first place. All right, and so <clears throat> so if you were to have zero here and non-zero here, this would have to be infinity. Um, so zero times infinity is indeterminate, and you can have a non-zero d. All right. So it's uh, it's an extraordinary situation where you you would be able to have a, a total cancellation of the uh, of the field within the material uh, due to the alignment of polar molecules. All right. So it's interesting. You can think about that uh, about how these two things fight each other, but there's uh, the polarization dependence here creates a self-limiting type of situation. So this is true even for not materials that are called nonlinear or chi-2 materials, sometimes they're called. One where the polarization is dependent on a total electric field in this way, where you have a square up here, all right? Or chi-3 materials, all right? So let's go back uh, just for a moment to uh, the equation d is equal to epsilon e sub t. Um, a what does a negative value of epsilon mean? Uh, what it means is that the polar molecule aligns itself such that it is flipped with respect to that which would normally happen. So if we go way back up to page two, is it? Boy, it's, it's, it's hanging up my computer. So right here, this would be what naturally happens. You have the applied external electric field, and then that causes a, the, a net warping of the electron cloud to have a net positive on this side of the molecule and a net negative on the other side, the left-hand side, all right? But now, a negative epsilon... Come on. would mean that it aligns itself in the opposite way. You have an applied external electric field along uh, this direction in the positive x hat. Uh, however, uh, the, ch the cl charge cloud density and charge densities of the molecule are worked in the exact opposite way you would expect. And uh, instead, you have a net positive charge on the left-hand side and a net negative charge on the right-hand side, all right? Now, such a thing, uh, nobody had ever found that that happens in nature, in naturally occurring materials. It, it always does the opposite. Um, that, that, uh, and so this is, this is uh, something that even though because Lago and many other folks tried to find, um, it just did not occur. So, so is this physical? Can we ever achieve the situation drawn above? Um, and so before we answer this question, let's look at the magnetic fields. So the magnetic field treatment is identical. And we kind of make it identical by adopting the same language. And, um, and so even though we don't have magnetic charge density, we can, for the moment, imagine that we do. Um, and write it just like we did uh, in a very similar way as when we were working with electric fields. So we have the del dot h sub total is equal to tau. Those are my magnetic charge densities over mu naught. All right. They themselves, uh, the, the tau sub t is a chart, magnetic charge density can be uh, a sum of two different types of charges, the bound magnetic charge and the free magnetic charge, and we can write it in this way. And you have the same type of equations um, because you do indeed have magnetic dipoles. So you do have a tau um, piece of V being the same formula that you have for the electric dipoles, all right? So minus del dot piece of M. All right, and you can put this equation into into this. Take the piece of M over, and uh, and you can now have this magnetic flux density is equal to mu naught a sub c piece of M. All right, just like we had with um, with the uh, electric polarization, you have this with the magnetic polarization. That piece of M is often mu chi a sub t. 
but not all the time. In fact, you break this relationship more often with magnetics than you do in electron in electromagnet in electric fields. All right. So, and that's the whole thing with hysteresis. All right. But let's say for the moment that you have this. So then you have B is equal to mu not 1 plus chi sub m h sub t. All right. Um, so, so this is a relative permeability, um, and uh, and and then uh, mu naught times mu r is just equal to mu, which is just the the permeability without the word met, uh, relative. So a negative value for mu and for chi means that the magnetic dipoles are aligned anti-parallel to the externally applied magnetic field. All right. So you are having a B that is in the opposite direction of the applied external magnetic field, H. All right. So besides small negative values for chi for diamagnetic materials, a, a negative for value for mu is not n encountered with naturally occurring materials. All right, you would need chi to be uh, at least larger than minus one in order to get mu to be minus. Um, and so that would mean that uh, that you have a field due to the polarization. Um, of the magnetic mole molecules that are that's fighting against um, the internal field, so you need a negative chi, <clears throat> and, and that doesn't occur in nature. Greater than minus one. All right. So okay, so um, we can't get that in nature due to uh, the double negatives or or even. One, just due to polarization of the molecules. You can't get negative epsilon, you can't get negative mu, just due to the, pol the uh, construction of dipoles. Um, so that's, the, that's at least th that for now, for now, okay? But we've only crossed off the list of only one possible way of getting those double negatives. Uh, but there's at least two or three other ways of getting it, as we'll talk about in a moment. But before we move on, I just wanted to add a couple of comments to what D is and E sub T uh, is as well. D is really can be really sort of considered as an auxiliary or helpful field in that it tells us how a material responds to externally applied or freely moving charges through the equation or by the equation, del dot d is equal to rho sub b, all right? But really, it is e sub t that is the true physical field. So remember that charges respond not to d in a material, but e sub t. Um, through the equation, f is equal to qe is equal to ma. And it's not qd is equal to ma, or q sub epsilon naught d is, is equal to ma, it is QE is equal to MA, all right? Um, so it's, it's, that's just interesting. I haven't really seen that in too many books when they talk about um, charges within, uh, the mo motion of charges within materials. It really is uh, QE is equal to MA. Um, and we'll get back to that in a moment, why that's important. Okay. But then you're naturally going to say, well, you know, uh, what about a metal? Uh, you know that in the visible regime, a low-loss metals like silver or gold largely have a negative real part to epsilon. So how does it achieve that? You just said that it's not possible. Um, well, I said it's not possible just with the polarization of the molecules, but you have another mechanism within metals. <clears throat> um, all right, so to uncover that mechanism, let's go back to Maxwell's equations. Where are we going? Okay. Maxwell's equations, um, we're, not, we're going to assume that we have net neutral um, charge within the material. <clears throat> so uh, del dot E is equal to zero. Del dot B is equal to zero. Del cross E is equal to minus dB over dt. And del cross H is J plus dD over dt. 
All right, and we're going to focus on time harmonic fields. I'm going to use I in here because we're using J here, and I don't want uh, any confusion. So, but we still use the plus I omega T instead of the physics minus I omega T. So that's different than Jackson. So let's uh, focus on the time harmonic fields. So we can take the time derivatives, replace those time derivatives with an I omega. That's what we do right here and right here. Um, now we're going to do some math. We're going to take this equation right here, take the curl of both sides, choosing the vector identity along with del dot e is equal to zero. We get that this left-hand side is just minus del squared e. Um, Laplacian operator is equal to, we take the del of this side, the curl of this side, minus i omega mu naught del cross h. So we have right here, but we have del cross h. It's this right here. So we substitute that in for the del cross h. And then we multiply it out and we get this. So, so far so good. Um, uh, this, obviously recognize that as 1 over c squared. So we have this now. Now we need a model for capital J, the current. Well, you've done this before. We know that current uh, is the net number of electrons uh, that are traveling times their, times their charge. All right? So, <clears throat> and it's really a number density. All right? So the number density of electrons times their charge times their velocity. All right? So we have to figure out their velocity. Uh, through the equation of motion. F is equal to ma, or dp over dt, is equal to the force on that electron, q, q times e, but they also relax or scatter, and, and so their momentum will slowly decay in the absence of an electric field, and that decay is, is characterized by this second term on the right-hand side, minus p over t. So, um, all my things are time harmonic, we assume that, so we have a P, um, a, a, this D over DT is replaced by an I omega, because we have time harmonic everything, is equal to this. We can solve for what P is in terms of E, and this is what we get. And P, of course, is equal to MV. So we can solve for V in here, and substitute this whole thing in for... Um, v divided by m, and we get this right here, all right, which is equal to the conductivity times the electric field, and this conductivity sigma is equal to a DC conductivity over the denominator, 1 plus i omega tau, and omega naught is n e squared tau over m. So now we have j as a function of e, so t, total. All right, so really this should be T right here. There. Thus putting this back into Maxwell's equations, we put and replace J with sigma E. And now we can pull out the E's and pull out the omega squared over C squared, and we get this right here. All right. And that is equal to my relative epsilon relative, relative permittivity, this whole thing in parentheses. Okay. So in the visible spectral regime, um, you're at a high enough frequency such that uh, omega compared to the scattering time is much, much greater than 1. So this term dominates over 1, uh, so you can neglect that. The i's will cancel. You'll have an omega squared down here. You'll also have a t um, tau epsilon naught. Tau times epsilon naught on the denominator that combines with the um, sigma naught such that this right up here, right here, is equal to omega p squared. So you can put for the visible spectral regime and in the IR for most materials, the relative epsilon is equal to 1 minus omega p squared over omega squared. Okay? The 1 is just coming from the d over dt. All right? It's coming from this part, which is coming from this, this part, right, this part, which, going back up, is coming from this part, which happens in, um, uh, um, non-conducting, um, uh, polar, uh, materials, all right, non-conducting, meaning even when J is zero, this is the displacement current, just produced by um, uh, the d over dt. 
And whereas the other part of this, so that's just a D over DT term, all right? That would be in all materials, all right? Independent of the current. But the current, when there is a current, that's what produces this, all right? And so it's the ability of electrons to go back and forth and to conduct, to flow in a material that's producing this right here. So electrons are uh, sloshing around, and that's creating this omega p over omega squared. Omega p squared over omega squared. All right? But that's the important thing because uh, for, um, <clears throat> for small, smaller omegas, for omegas that are less than omega p, that will be that will be um, that will yield a negative epsilon r, and so that'll yield a negative epsilon r, and uh, and so uh, when your omegas are less than omega p, uh, your epsilon r will be epsilon relative will be negative. Okay, so that's interesting. That's interesting. So you can indeed get a negative epsilon just by having a metal. All right. So, so that's that. Um, so you say, well, okay, let's just use that. Well, the bad thing about it uh, is a couple of things that I note on this next page here. Uh, so we can indeed get a negative epsilon. So do we really care what causes negative epsilon? Does it really matter? Um, does it really matter uh, if it is the electric current J or the polarization of the material's molecular building blocks that produces this epsilon, negative epsilon? Can we have one or the other? And you might say, well, yeah, sure. But there's some trade-offs, all right? The answer is um, to that is not at not at first. It's not a problem at first. Not when we want just to make the first metal material and, and investigate their amazing properties. You can go ahead and use metals to get a negative um, epsilon. Uh, and this was done by Smith and Pendry in their first papers, late uh, 1999 and 2000, shortly thereafter. They actually did use uh, metal rods in one direction to produce negative epsilon in that direction. Uh, just simply due to what we did, this whole concept right here, all right? Um, so you can do proof of concept stuff with that. However, we have some issues. However, electric current in metals typically has a lot more optical absorption than the process of mole molecules aligning their polarization. Um, so you'll experience a lot more optical loss when trying to tap in to uh, negative epsilons of metals due to conduction, rather than trying to do something with the polarization of the molecules um, or any other method. So also, epsilon um, given by the Druda model, uh, this model that gives us behavior, this is the Druda model, yeah, it obviously has a strong omega dependence. All right, so uh, you have the omega squared in the denominator. That's called dispersion uh, when you have a strong dependence of something on omega. All right, so as a strong dependence on omega, then typically encountered with a epsilon produced by polarization effects. All right, so um, for example, silicon oxide uh, has a epsilon and it's right around 2.1, so it's not negative, but it's it's 2.1 or so. And it has certainly less dispersion, less dependence on omega than gold, silver, or copper does in the visible spectral regime. So, Also, nature does not allow for magnetic current. Hence, we cannot get a negative mu due to the movement of magnetic charge. There is no magnetic charge. So right off the bat, uh, you can't use uh, this concept of current, in this case magnetic current, uh, to get a negative mu. So we have to find another way of doing it. Is there another way? Question mark. 
Yes, there is. <clears throat> Let's find a molecule that produces an electric field upon polarization that is larger in magnitude than the driving field. All right. So um, this is what we want. Um, we want to be able to have an external field in, in this direction. And then we want to, to have uh, a material that creates an extraordinarily large uh, field in the opposite direction. All right. Um, and so in that case, we want E sub P, the field produced by this, these dipoles, such that in the material D is equal to epsilon naught T plus P, which is equal to epsilon E sub T. Um, but we want this to be negative, such that D is in the opposite direction of E sub T. All right. So we want D and P in the minus X direction and E sub T in the positive X direction. So, no naturally occurring molecule exhibits this property. We need to go uh, beyond, or meta, meta means beyond, uh, the molecular building blocks that nature provides. And then we, ha we have to use engineered uh, metamolecules that yield epsilon is less than zero. So, Electrical engineers, microwave engineers, RF engineers, optical engineers, uh, many physicists, we all know that electromagnetic resonances can produce this effect. So we can have a driving electric field. You know, we can have a, a driving electric field in one direction. And, if, and you produce a resonance which causes a very strong uh, field, stronger than the driving field, and strong, but in the opposite direction. <clears throat> All right, and so uh, to most lay people, people that don't know engineering or math, physics, they would say that's, that sounds a little weird where you have uh, some effect pushing one way, but at that very moment, uh, you have a large displacement in the other direction. But you have that in all sorts of natural systems, and that's called a resonance. All right, um, so... Um, so resonances can produce this. So Pendry, Smith, uh, various other folks realized that that's what you have to do. So Pendry tried several different types of uh, metamolecules to achieve mu is less than zero and epsilon is less than zero in the same or different parts of the metamolecule. In fact, and, and in particular, Pendry considered this edge coupled split ring resonator shown below. All right. So, um, so with this edge split ring resonator, what he had was uh, you have a ring and you have a split in the ring. And uh, he had two um, separate rings, one nested within the other with the splits on either side. Um, and uh, this was, uh, he did this for two reasons. One, to combine both a, uh, uh, some functionalities that produced both a negative mu and a negative epsilon all in one structure, um, and also to increase the capacitance, <clears throat> uh, which lowered the operating frequency. So when an oscillating magnetic field is along the positive Z direction, at resonance, it produces both an induced magnetic field in the opposite direction. So um, when the driving field, a magnetic field is in the Z direction, <coughs> It will, at resonance, pr produce an induced field that's in the minus z direction. But it also produces an induced electric field at resonance as well, because you, you will have basically um, all, uh, an oscillation, negative charge, positive charge, um, positive charge, negative charge, in this way on the two split ring resonators. This creates an electric dipole. That electric dipole produces an electric field. That electric field is stronger in magnitude, but in opposite direction of the driving electric field. So Smith, with this edge coupled split ring resonator, was able to create both negative epsilon and negative mu within a single structure. So we'll get into the equations um, next time of uh, the regular split ring resonator along with this edge coupled split ring resonator. But I wanted to uh, spend today uh, looking at the physics behind 
uh, the electric permittivity and the magnetic susceptibility. All right. So that is it for now. Exactly 45 minutes. So uh, take care, everybody, and and we'll do another recording later this week.